We just join in with a time of worship here this morning. Sing the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. He goes before me. Defender behind me. favor be upon you and a thousand generations 
your family, their children, and their children, and their children. May His presence go before you, and behind you, and beside you, all around you, and within you. He is with you, He is with you, in the morning, in the evening, and you're coming, you're going, and you're weeping, rejoicing. He is for you, He is for you, He is for you, He is for you, He is for you. children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening and you're coming and you're going and you're weeping and rejoicing he is for you he is for you he is for you, 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 yeah. Amen, 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 amen. Good morning. Happy Sunday. I want to start my time with you with a series of thank yous. Thank you for the time of prayer. And thank you, Brother Eli, for leading us by worship into the presence of God. I also want to say a great big thank you to all the faithful of Portland Pentecostals who have continued to give of your tithe and offering. I can guarantee you by the word of God that you will be blessed by continuing to give in this fashion. But we are living in a time of what we have called sheltering in place. Some of you may wonder, what can I do while I am sheltering in place to impact my world? Today, we are going to examine just a small segment of a life of a man who loved his fellow man, gave generously, and prayed frequently and fervently. We will be exploring the impact that his life had on his household, his generation, and his world. We're going to read from Acts chapter number 10, and I will promise you we're going to read a lot of scripture this morning because at Portland Pentecostals, we believe the word of God is above all else. Acts chapter 10 and verse number one reads, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household and gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision the angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he had observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers. Everybody say your prayers. Your prayers, Cornelius, and your alms have come up as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon a tanner, whose house is by the sea. 
He will tell you what you must do. And when the angel who had spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who continually waited on him. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. Have you tried recently to get someone's attention with just a little courtesy wave? And then you had to holler at them or flash your lights or honk your horn? <laughs> People can be trained to respond to particular sounds. I remember growing up and going to visit my grandmother and she was on a party line and the phone would ring and I'd run for it and she'd say, oh, no, 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 ours is two shorts and a long. Her ears were tuned to that two shorts and a long. Probably when you hear the phone ring, you could tell if it's your ring or somebody else's. Do you recognize the voice of your child or perhaps the laugh of your spouse? Sounds do attract the attention of God. There are more actions that also draw God to the side of a man or a woman. A confirming statement is made by Jesus to his disciples in Matthew 10 and 42. And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of water in the name of a disciple, assuredly, I say unto you, he shall by no means lose his reward. So God does watch what you are doing. Our character study is of Cornelius, who was not a Jew. He was not of God's chosen nation. He was considered an outsider at best and considered an enemy at worst of the Jewish people because he was a Roman centurion. He understood the chain of command. He was used to discipline. Cornelius respected order. He was good. He feared God, respected and obeyed God. He gave generously to the needs of others and he prayed regularly. One translation of Acts 10 and 2 says, he was a thoroughly good man. He had led everyone in his household to live worshipfully fully before God and always helping people in need and had a habit of prayer. A habit of prayer. Conversation with God. Cornelius was right with God. He was right with his fellow man. And he was an influencer. He built a memorial before God. But the memorial was a memorial of cumulative effect. You and I cannot build a memorial in one day. Mount Rushmore was not built in one day. It was built over a period of years. In the fourth verse of Acts chapter number 10, I want to reword and reread the words that described the lifestyle of this man, Cornelius. He observed all things righteously. And then an angel visits him and tells him why he is there. God heard your prayer and God has seen your generosity. So I am here. That was when God's tipping point came. Again, my sermon title is God's Tipping Point. The result of a tipping point in the life of Cornelius was life-changing because an angel was sent to him. This was an astounding event, an unusual event. The attention of God was on Cornelius. There have been times in my life when I knew God was focusing on me. And it is my hope that my words today will push us and propel us in the direction of seeking the face of God and building a memorial before him so that his attention is upon us. True to character, Cornelius prepared his servants and his soldiers and, and he sent uh, unto Joppa and Peter was escorted into the household of this righteous man, Cornelius. And Peter began to preach to Cornelius and his household. 
proof of the relationship that Cornelius had was God was in the middle of, right in the middle of the sermon of Peter and instruction of Peter, he began to receive the Holy Spirit and speak with other tongues. Peter reaffirms this later on when he goes before his fellow brethren and apostles in Jerusalem in chapter number 15. Not only did Cornelius receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but his whole household received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They were born again. And at the conclusion of his sermon, Peter said, you must be born again of the water and the Spirit. He commanded them commanded them to be baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And another tipping point came. The result was that the gospel was open to the Gentiles, which includes me and most of you listening. The result was not just life changing. It was earth changing. When the attention of God is upon you, anything can happen. The impossible becomes possible. The far becomes near. The unforgivable can be forgiven. The past can be erased and the future can become the now. Do you need a tipping point in your life today? Do you need a God tipping point in your life today? Do you want to be a world changer? Do you want to move the hand of God? What is it you need from God? What is it you want from God? What is it that you have been promised by God? What brings God to his tipping point? When studying the scripture, we can often understand a great deal from the attitudes and the actions of the lives of righteous individuals. Cornelius provoked God's tipping point. How? We know he was a thoroughly good man. He led everyone in his household to live worshipfully before God. I ask you, heads of household, gentlemen in particularly, are you leading your family to be submitted to the word of God, the will of God, the purpose of God? Are you praying with them? Are you worshiping with them? Especially during this time when we cannot join together in corporate worship settings. Are you giving generously and regularly to the needs of others? You see, he was in a habit of praying. He had enough humility to receive the instruction from the man of God. And he was willing to change. And now he was anxious to grow. I'm preaching about God's tipping point. There are dozens of other individuals in the scripture or groups of individuals that move God to his tipping point. Joshua and the children of Israel move God to a tipping point as they entered Canaan's land. Joshua had spied out Canaan's land and he had spied out this city called Jericho. While he was spying it out, he met the captain of the Lord's host, which I believe was a theophany or a manifestation of God. A plan was given to him and he followed out and directed that plan. Once a day for six days during the week, they marched once around the city in silence. On the seventh day, they marched six times around the city in silence. And then the seventh time has brought, brought the tipping point when they completed the will of God in their life and they shouted with a great shout, the walls fell down flat. The people marched until until the tipping point came and the walls fell down flat. This is what gave way for the children of Israel to go into the promised land. It is what gave the Hebrew children their destiny and it changed their lives forever. We must be willing, you must, I must be willing to listen to the plan of God and follow it to its completion. Had they only marched six times, six days, and six times the last day, the tipping point never would have come. I cannot tell you where the tipping point is in your life, but God knows. He's given you instruction. He's told us to be faithful 
We preached about it recently. Will God find faith on the earth? Or do you have that stained faith that's going to stick in there until? Don't run in fear. Don't hide and cower away. If you will stay right here where God has planted you, he will provide for you and he will provide miraculously. Remember, those that didn't stick with it were willing to run back to Egypt and all they had to look forward to was slavery. And because they even thought about and declared that they would go back, they died in a wilderness without having received the promise. I think of Daniel, the wise man. He'd been three full weeks in mourning. He was a captive in the land of uh, Babylon. And Daniel and the children of Israel were living together in captivity. They had been promised restoration. They had been given hope. But the day of fulfillment seemed a long ways off. And there was no temple of God to pray at or temple where they could offer sacrifice. Thank God we will be able to return. But right now, you've got to make your house a temple. We have got to make our house a place of sacrifice. There were no sacrifice offerings, wave offerings, or heave offerings. There were no sounds of the trumpet giving a solemn call to come and worship. The great feast and fast of Jehovah were not being celebrated. But just because there wasn't a group fast didn't mean that Daniel couldn't fast. He fasted and prayed for 21 days, and he persisted. Daniel included that regular regimen of praying, and he continued for three full weeks, dying out to self because he needed an answer from God. He needed a tipping point. He needed something to move the needle to the other side from fear to love, from failure to faith, from a time of loss to a time of gain. This was a time of seeking the voice of God, not of asking God to give him, Daniel, what he wanted. I hope in this time, you're not just praying selfishly, but you're praying, thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about him, Jesus, and them. The lost world out there, we have a mission. The breakthrough did come for Daniel. And perhaps you remember the angel appearing and saying, hey, don't fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before the Lord God, your words were heard and I have become because of your words. He said, I came because you prayed. You moved the needle. The illustration was given and the declaration was made. I fought for 21 days and nobody stood with me to fight against the prince of Persia, but your prince. Oh, we are warring a warfare. We do not know when the tipping point will come and when the scourge will be pushed back or when we'll come back to the house of God. You don't know when your healing, your deliverance, your provision will come. That is determined by God and God alone. But you can move the needle. The messenger broke through the ranks of darkness, gave peace to Daniel, and revelation came to Daniel concerning the future plans of God for him and the children of Israel. Daniel had no idea how many days it would take, how long he would need to fast and pray, but he fasted until. Daniel prayed until God's tipping point was reached. I would say to you and I, Fast and pray until we reach the tipping point. Jesus' disciples learned how to pray until their instruction upon his departure was to go and wait for the promise of the Father in Jerusalem. Acts 1 and 4 says, And being assembled together, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days from now. 
Did they go? Yes. Did they obey? Yes. For somewhere between seven to ten days, a group of individuals gathered. They prayed. The disciples were obedient. And the tipping point came when the day of Pentecost was fully come. The Holy Ghost fell. Cloven tongues like as a fire set upon each of them. And they spoke with other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. And the Victory was won for them. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. God's tipping point came, but they had to pray until their lives were changed. Our world was changed. Their world was changed. I recall also a time when the church had had what they looked at as a tragedy and maybe perhaps an end. Peter had been thrown into prison for preaching and uh, they delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him in and they intended to bring him before the people after Passover. These were troublesome times for the church and persecution had come upon them persistently from governmental officials. And the chief apostle was Peter and now he was in trouble. He was kept in prison but verse 5 says, constant prayer was offered by the church for him. The saints were gathered at the house of Mary, the mother of John. This was not some rogue group that had said, we don't need one another. We don't need the body. We don't need a man of God in our life. This was likely a house group under the direction of Mark. It was a connect group. It was sanctioned by the apostles. Be careful that you don't get caught up in some rogue group or, or, or veer off on your own or in this time when you cannot be in the house of God or see your pastor face to face. Don't lose hope and don't lose the voice of God and don't rely on yourself alone. This large group prayed consistently. Peter was sleeping and the angel came and tapped him on the side and, and he led him out of the prison. And it wasn't until he got outside that Peter realized he wasn't dreaming. This was a real experience. Peter was ushered to freedom and the angel disappeared and the disciples were shocked. You see, they prayed and they didn't even know the tipping point had come because they kept on praying. That was all right. Better to pray longer than miss it by just a little bit. God's tipping point came and deliverance came miraculously from the heavenly realm, from outside of the earthly realm. It wasn't because they went to court or they appealed or they had some government favor, but God intervened. Pray for deliverance. Pray for freedom to worship again. But Peter still had to walk to the house and the saints had to be convinced that he really was there at the door alive. The disciples did not know how long they needed to pray, but they prayed until. Think of the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 27 and 28. He is being taken to Rome on a ship and he has told them not to leave one port and go to another, but the captain doesn't listen to a tent maker, of course. He's the captain of the ship and they run into Eurocladon, which was probably a typhoon and it had lasted for 13 days and they saw no moon, no sun, no heavenly bodies. And the Bible says, Paul was fasting. He was fasting until an angel appeared by his side. And he put it something like this. The angel of the Lord, whose I am, stood by me this night. And he said, look, it's going to be all right. You're going to lose the ship. You're going to lose these material things, but your life will be spared. Life is the important thing. Folks, we can lose all the material things that we have, but if our life is spared, we can continue to have a relationship with Jesus and he can restore all of those things. The tipping point came and a message came to Paul and that message was delivered to a heathen shipmaster and to those on board. And he said, whatever you do, don't leave the ship. They did not the ship broke apart. They swam to shore. They hung on to boards and all 276 souls were spared. And when they got to Melita, the island, a snake came out and bit 
Paul on his hand and they thought, ah, a murderer. He missed the sea, but now a snake's going to kill him. But when he didn't die, they said, surely he's a god. And Paul began to preach the gospel. Their lives were spared. The miraculous had happened. And an island nation of Melita received the gospel, including their king. Eternal destiny was changed because somebody fasted until the tipping point. Friends, church, saints, members of Portland Pentecostals, maybe even some of you that have drifted away. It's time for prayer. It's time for fasting. It's time for living righteously, of giving generously, and submitting to the Word of God and the man of God. Abraham is a little bit different story. The Word came to Abraham because he was a friend of God that I'm about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because they're evil. And Abraham decided he would pray to God or bargain with God. And he began to bargain with God. Well, what if there's 50 righteous? Oh, I'll spare it. And he whittles his way down to 10. And he said, what if there's 10 righteous? And God says, if there's 10 righteous, I will spare Sodom and Gomorrah. But he couldn't. Find 10 righteous. Abraham could not read the mind of God. And I'm not criticizing Abraham today. Please understand me. But Sodom and Gomorrah were not spared because there were not 10. What if he kept asking God and said, four? Would he have found four? You see, the destruction came. Many lives were lost, and only three lives were spared. Their world was changed. Could it be that if Abraham would have prayed just a little bit longer, they would have been spared? I'm asking, where is God's tipping point? You and I don't know. So we must continue to pray. We must continue to fast. I ask you again, is, what is it you need from God? What is it that you want from God? Or what is it that you have been promised to by God? How do we get to the tipping point? Back to Cornelius. We read he was a thoroughly good man. Are you living life as righteously as possible? He was leading everyone in his household in a life of worship to God. He was giving generously and regularly to the needs of others. This is the book. This is the scripture. I'm not just manufacturing this. We need to abide by these principles and get in the habit of praying regularly to God. And if we do, God will visit us. He will give us dreams. He will give us visions. He will give us understanding. And if I had the time and had them written down, I could tell you of dreams and visions that have been given to many who have been part of the assembly of Portland Pentecostals, and they've seen them come true. And in fact, just over a week ago, I got a message on Messenger and I didn't know who it was from, and it was a young man who used to attend Portland Pentecostals that no longer lives in the city. And he said, Pastor, do you remember when I had a dream that the church was full? Looked like the dream came true. Listen and obey the voice of God. Obey His Word. Obey the voice of the prophet, of the man of God. We all need an outside voice. I have outside voices that speak into my life on a regular basis. I have outside voices that before I make a major decision, I go for counsel to those men of God and they counsel me as to what I should do. Be humble. Be submissive enough to do more than what you're doing. I'm preaching about God's tipping point. If our attitude is right, we can push God to his tipping point. There are a few more scriptures that I'm going to read today that reemphasize the fact 
and the effect of the characteristics of Cornelius. If we can obey these scriptures, we can activate God's tipping point. James 5 and 16 says, confess your trespasses one to another. In other words, don't be a hypocrite. If you're wrong, tell somebody. Ask them to pray with you and get over it. If you've made a mistake, it's time to repent. If you're going in the wrong direction, it's time for a turnaround. If you made a poor decision, it's time to undo that decision. Even if you're deep into that decision, you can back out. It's better than going forward and suffering the consequences. And pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again. And the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. It doesn't say God told him to pray. He prayed. God heard his prayer. This is the way another translation puts verse number 16. The earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. If you and I will qualify ourselves by the characteristics that are manifest in the life of Cornelius that we have discussed, if we will be persistent and consistent in our prayer, we can change history. Consistent prayer activates the tipping point of God. Now is our day to impact our households. Now is our day to impact those in our sphere of influence. Now is our day to impact our generation. The church under pressure, under persecution, we find Words written to them in Romans chapter number 12. Words by the Apostle Paul. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. <laughs> Are you being patient? It's hard. It's difficult. Then he goes on to say... Continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. I would say that loving our fellow man activates the tipping point of God. Giving generously activates the tipping point of God. Effectual, fervent prayer activates the tipping point of God, forgiveness and love of one another activates the tipping point of God. Do you want to be a world changer? Do you want to move the hand of God? Do you want to impact this generation? What is it you need from God? Again, I ask, what is it that you want or desire from God? And what is it that he has promised you? Perhaps the clearest word of provocation can come from Jesus. Remember when we studied the, the persistent woman and it says she came repeatedly appealing for justice to the church at Ephesus. Paul wrote in verse 18 of chapter six, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. It's time to pray for one another. It's time to pray for the lost of our world. It's time, fathers, to gather your family together. It's time, husbands, to hold your wife by the hand and pray with her. It's time to submit to the word and the will and the purpose of God. This is not a time to be a loner, to be independent, to, to be proud, to be boastful, to be distant from God or his word. Give until God's tipping point is activated. Fast until God's tipping point comes. Pray until God's tipping point is reached. God will use you 
to bring about a tipping point. I'm asking you to join with your family, with those in your household. Hold them by the hand. Make a fresh and a new commitment. Rehearse the characteristics of Cornelius. Be thoroughly good. Give generously to others. Pray regularly. Submit to the word of God and the voice of the man of God. Obey what God is telling you to do. And the tipping point will come. Today could be the time for your tipping point.